Good afternoon. We're here with the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, Richard Boucher. Okay, if I can start with our first question. Sure. What role does cultural diplomacy have in overcoming development challenges that arise in multilateral trade negotiations? Well, there's two, there's two aspects. One is that culture itself is a traded good. Right. And so, you, you know, music videos, all that stuff gets traded, and you have to have a common set of rules so that it can flow freely, so that people can hear from each other and s learn about each other uh, with cultural goods. And the second is there's, you know, there's kind of a culture of cooperation that has to be built. Uh, people are very mistrustful of trade right now, and in, even in our own political systems, everybody's worried about trade. And yet, you know, we have this innate sense that if we start working together, maybe we can all do better. And building up that culture of exchanges, culture of trade, I think is an important foundation for trade negotiations. I see. understand. And um, in your opinion, what roles does cultural diplomacy have when it comes to, say, a different area, like an international trade organization, such as the World Bank, the WTO, or the OCD? Is there a role for cultural diplomacy there in bringing these groups together? I think it, maybe it's not so much cultural diplomacy because most of the people in those organizations already have a fair amount of international experience. They know that people are different and they have different histories and experience, but actually bringing that history and experience to bear on different problems can be very useful because you can see different ways of solving problems. And they may not all work for you, but if you listen to the way other people have, have taken on education challenges or fixed their health care system or improved their government procurement, maybe you won't do what he does or she does, but you may figure out between that what you want to do. And it gives you more options, gives you more understanding. So it's that, that culture of learning, that culture of cooperation that gives you a better set of options when you go home and you try to make your own policy. I see almost the ability to learn from one another, one another's mistakes yeah, and successes. Exactly. Okay, I'll send uh, to it. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, that's kind of like the, uh, the way the states do it, isn't it? The way um, the federal system, that it's a kind of a melting pot, there's 50 states, you know, yeah, everyone tries their own system. Yeah, to some extent. We bring in, you know, pieces from all over the country, and there's this constant pressure, it's sort of a debate in the United States over, is, is this area like education supposed to be totally left to the states or even the counties, the lower levels? Or should the federal government start imposing standards and guidelines that everybody has to meet? And so there's a constant tension, tension back and forth. There's a little more law involved and, and a lot more money involved than for international organizations where you're really just trying to learn from each other. And you know, what works and what doesn't is how you help figure out what, how to make your policy better. Of course. Yeah. If we were to stay on the United States for one moment, would you say that movements such as the Occupy Wall Street movement have changed the nature or have the potential to change the nature of American politics? I don't know if it's changed the nature, but it's sort of the latest manifestation of a, there's always a group of people that are rejecting whatever is going on in the establishment. Uh, right. I think America was founded on questioning authority. And it's sometimes good to remind all of us, and including people in authority, that it's legitimate to ask those questions. It's legitimate to say, is this working? It's legitimate to say, can't you do this better? And uh, Occupy Wall Street comes out of a real, I think, popular resentment to who's benefited from the current system. Okay. And comes out of a real desire that you see all over the world for more equality, less corruption, more fairness. I mean, fairness is just fundamental to people. It creates revolutions in the Arab world, demonstrations in India, and Occupy Wall Street. But, um, I'd like to ask a question of some, maybe some of the criticisms of the OECD, if that's sure. okay. Yeah. One of the criticisms has been uh, by critics is that the OECD is too narrow because it's limited, its membership is limited only to select few rich states. In 1997 and 1998, there was a draft multilateral agreement on investment which was heavily criticized by several NGOs and developing countries. What do you say, what do you say about the division between North and South or about these criticisms in general? I think generally we've tried to take them to heart. Mm -hmm. um, we realize that a lot of the economic models that we've been using maybe aren't complete, aren't well adapted to the new world, that the world's changing. 
Uh, we've done reports on uh, what some people call shifting wealth. It's not really losing from our countries. I mean, OECD countries are already pretty diverse. Chile joined last year. Mexico's in. Turkey, Korea, you know, people at different levels of income. Um, but I think there's a lot to learn. There is shifting wealth. There is more growth in other parts of the world. Some of that's understood. Some of that's not well understood how they do it. So what we're trying to do now is sort of integrate into our economic understanding whether it's specific issues that we study or whether it's more general. What's going on in the rest of the world? What's going on in these big emerging markets? Uh, how do you understand their different perspectives and their different ways of doing things? What can we learn from them? Uh, but even, you know, even the head of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, gave a speech last summer saying, we need to learn from the emerging markets. So I think people understand the world's a bigger place and a different place than it was 10, 20 years ago, and we're going to adapt to that. Were these concerns legitimate, or was it mostly something you fear something you can't really understand? I think, um, I think first of all, this, these were the most successful economies in the world. Okay. Um, when Chile wanted to join, the Chilean president said, this is the club of successful reformers. Uh, that's what, what Colombia is doing now. They're trying to get closer to the OECD because they see it as, as a place where people who want to reform can learn how to do it well and who can succeed. So it's not that there was a permanent model, but it's the organization has to adapt to the new world. So it's a legitimate con criticism in that we overlooked things. We, you know, the, the, what we were doing led to the economic crisis. We better learn from that. And we better do things differently. And I think we understand that. When it comes, in your opinion, how do you think the OECD needs to be reformed in any way? trying to open up, We're trying to open up not just to have new member countries, but to work more with China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, North Africa, you know, Southern Africa, all of Latin America. And it's just becoming a more open organization, a more flexible organization, having maybe not so, what can I say, not having the same recommendations for everybody using what we know to help people in more country-specific ways. So yes, we have to transform ourselves. What are the roadblocks to these reforms? Um, I think part of it is, is uh, we have to understand different political systems better. We have to understand the difference between policy and implementation. In a lot of our countries, once you decide a policy, you have the government bureaucrats, the legal associations, the federal regulation system, the business associations, all the red tape, the education, but the red tape, but also the systems for making it happen. So if we decide to institute a value-added tax, we actually have the capability of applying a value-added tax. Some countries, particularly developing countries, they can decide on a value-added tax, but it, making it happen is the hard part. Deciding what the policy is is not the hard part. It's setting up that entire apparatus throughout the country to do it. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to talk about how you have a more efficient health care system. We have to use what we know to understand how do you start a health care system? What diseases do you cover? Do you use clinics, doctors? Do you use health care workers? Do you use insurance? I mean, some countries are just starting, and that's the kind of new understanding we have to create, and I don't think we have that yet. So we're trying to partner a lot with the World Bank, with the UN development program and other organizations that have more of that experience. Okay, thank you. Sorry, that was a long answer, but it's a complicated uh, of course. question. There's a question I'd like to follow up on that. The OECD is involved in uh, improving aid effectiveness yeah. throughout the world with the uh, recent Busan, uh, Busan, the Busan Declaration. Yeah. Declaration yeah. Yeah. Uh, does that um, comply with that well? of that effort of the OECD to open up to the rest of the world yeah. and uh, what are the next steps? Very much. Um, what Busan was about was development effectiveness. We've always talked about aid effectiveness and the OECD has been where we kind of tracked donor contributions. Were people meeting their targets? How were they using the money? Was it really helping people? Uh, were their policies consistent? You know, if you gave them aid, were you taking, were you buying their textiles? You know, questions like that. What Busan said is that it's more than aid. The millions and millions of people that have come out of poverty in the last 10 or 20 years, it's been because of economic systems, because of exports, because of investments, because of governance changes. And so 
you need to integrate that whole picture of how do societies develop and how do people get out of poverty. And so we're developing a development strategy that says, hey, we can use what we know about our process of development and our work with countries around the world to talk about how do you set up healthcare in poor countries, what does competition policy mean in, in developing countries, and sort of apply a broader look at these economies and how they can really mobilize their own resources and use international resources, aid and investment, and exports to develop out of poverty. And that's the contribution we think we can make. Um, just a follow-up question on that. In the development sphere, we can see the rise of new donors like Turkey, but also countries in the Middle East, like not Saudi Arabia, but um, the EAU, yeah. uh, improving uh, their contribution to development in the, well, the least developed countries. Uh, are they going to be part of the, of the OECD anytime soon? Does that mean that they deserve to be part of that club? And, uh, yeah, I mean, Turkey's uh, in, yes. uh, but we work with a lot of other countries whether they're going to be members or not. We've done some interesting things with China on assistance in Africa, where we've looked together at how assistance works in Africa and how to make it more effective. Uh, we're doing some interesting work with Brazil on South-South cooperation because it's not just money. And a lot of the programs that countries like Brazil have or India have is technical assistance, it's sharing knowledge, sharing agricultural knowledge, governance knowledge, you know. Uh, Indian election commissioners sometimes go to other countries where they have, they're invited to talk about how they run their elections. And sometimes that experience is more relevant than what you might learn from the United States or Finland. And so I think one of the things we've been looking at a lot is triangular cooperation. Not just how do you measure and evaluate South-South cooperation, but how do you get you know, money from here, expertise from there, teachers or doctors from here, and put it together in a package that countries can use to develop. We're doing a, a tax administration program in Southern Africa where we and the South African Tax Authority work together to help other countries develop their tax systems. It's a good example. Could I just ask, um, with respect to the development recommendations that you distribute to countries, how can you ensure to the best of your ability that such developments will be sustainable? I don't mean in economic terms, I mean in environmental terms. Well, we've done a lot of work now on green growth. We had right. a big green growth study that came out last year, and I think learning to apply that into different environments is kind of the next stage. And part of it's what we know about innovation policy. How do you use economic incentives to encourage people in the right direction? Things you can do with government procurement, where government buys, you know, gas-powered buses for the cities. You know, that creates a market, creates a product, creates a supply chain in the country. Um, things you can do with universities to develop new products. Uh, how do your tax systems work? How do your subsidies work? Overall, I mean, one of the, one of the, some of the work we've done, if people eliminated fossil fuel subsidies, there's a lot of money going into subsidizing fuel and diesel and stuff like that around the world. If you could get rid of that in the world, you would improve government budgets, you would reduce the use of hydrocarbons, and you'd probably save, you know, I, I, it's something like 6% of the greenhouse gases for the next 30 or 40 years. So there, there are specific things governments can do, and we're trying to help governments figure out how to do that. And do you think reasonable progress is being made towards that, towards um, reducing the amount of fossil fuels that's being used? Reasonable progress, yes. But uh, a lot of people fear we're at a point where reasonable progress is not enough. Yeah. And you've got to really make very significant steps very quickly. Okay. What is your position on climate change and economic development? We, um, we, what we're trying to look at is not the science of climate change, although you know, we have to understand that. We're looking at the economics of climate change. What's it going to do to water, migration, things like that around the world? Um, how are people going to cope? Um, how do you finance these green programs? What kind of taxes do you use? What kind of incentives do you use? How do you put a price on carbon? Which is, we think, one of the fundamental things you have to do. Change the equation for what people invest in and how they get their energy. Um, how do you develop the new technologies and make sure they get marketed? Not just developed at universities, but get out into the market and get adapted. And adopted. So, a lot of what we're looking at is the economics of making this stuff work and not just having the science develop it, but actually making it work. Um, as yesterday was International Women's Day, how can you 
ensure that the developments that you push for in the developing world come alongside social development? We do, I think, well, let's see. We've got a big project on gender that's coming up that's going to be done in, in right. May. And it focuses on three things. One is education, second is employment, and the third is entrepreneurship for women. And, you know, in economic terms, I mean, women are people, but you say this is the least, probably the most underused economic resource that any country has. And bringing women into the econ economy, bringing them into the workplace, having the right set of programs so that they can come into the workforce, maybe go out of the workforce for a while and come back in. Um, having daycare so women can work I mean, is pretty fundamental. But uh, unfortunately, it fits them instead of the males in the society. And so you really want to maximize the potential of everybody in your society and make use of all that creative energy. And that's what we're trying to look at. How do you make those things happen? We have a women's business forum program in North Africa where we're looking at this in with some of the North African governments. Mm -hmm. And they're very intent, to, particularly after these revolutions, to make sure that women have a role. And what we're seeing is there are a lot of barriers to entrepreneurship, to finance, to jobs generally, but women face more barriers than others. So you've got to fix the sort of initial barriers that apply to everybody, and then you've got to look at some of the specific things that affect women. Okay. Reinserting women in the work place and those kind of countries is definitely a concern, but I'm thinking of the report from Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen, which mentioned the value of other activities such as well, housewives, etc., and the value that it produces for society. Does the OECD, uh, did the OECD learn from that report or take any We've, we've done a lot of work um, on what we call measuring progress of societies, and this comes out of San and Stiglitz and Fatuzzi, and they had a, a thing like that. And, and part of what we're trying to do there is saying, hey, there's, there are a lot of things that don't get measured in standard economic instruments, and one of them is the value of housework. And, uh, you know, if we all worked at each other's house and paid each other, it would be, it would go into our GDP figures, but if you work at home and clean your own house, then it doesn't count. And it's sort of weird, but that's the way the systems have worked. And so what we're looking at, how do you measure good economic activity, things that contribute to society and, and to, uh, uh, to bettering people's lives uh, beyond GDP, beyond the standard measurements we use? And I think if you start measuring that, if you start looking at those contributions, then you also start valuing them and looking at how you can encourage the good ones. If, hypothetically, in your opinion, how would the economics of the world change if the rest of the world, including the U.S., adopted, let's say, Bhutan's happiness index? Mm -hmm. um, look, I, I love Bhutan. Mm -hmm. I've been there a couple times. I love the great uh, gross national happiness uh, indicators. Um, what we're trying to do is to take the basic concept and turn it into measurable statistics. Mm -hmm. And part of that's because that's what we do, that's what economists do, is they like to measure things. But you want something that you can measure objectively, that you can have a clear measurement of from one country to another and to another. And asking people if they're happy doesn't fit that bill. And second of all, you want something you can track over time, so you can see how it's changed. Of course. But you want something that you can then draw some conclusions from. Why is it changed? What creates well-being? Mm -hmm. You know, is it having security, having health care, having employment, having education? How much do these things contribute? Because what ultimately you want is not just to measure whether people like their lives, but you want to measure, you want to draw conclusions and, and measure what can you do? What can you do to help people feel better about their lives? What can you do to help families have a better sense of well-being? And so you got to take it to the point where you measure it, and then you can do something about it. And part of measurement is, you know, if you know what's going to be on test, that's what you study. So if you know that there's going to be a statistic every year that rates family household well-being, governments are going to put more effort into making sure that households have better well-being. Do you think there's, the answer is to have a consumer society or else, like Aldous Huxley, Brave New World? 
to keep everybody happy by being on pills? Or is there another answer, maybe? I, you know, I, I, I guess I, maybe it's because I'm an American. I think it's, you know, let people do what they want. Good to answer. The, to the greatest extent you can, you know, let people do what they want. And you find people have amazing energy and creativity, and they seek wealth in all kinds of interesting ways, but they want to better their lives, sometimes with art and sometimes with iPhones and sometimes with machinery and equipment, you know, and so let them do it. Um, and most of economics boils down to that, is how do you unleash those energies and let people create things? So I think that's what makes us all better off. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. It's very interesting.